Masochism claims to do what it is unable to. Lead a human to God and salvation. There is no and cannot be any divine grace in schism. Schismatic grace comes from scoundrels creating schism, from civil servants lobbying them, and from political parties nurturing them. A dissenter is a perjurer, an apologist of the civil war, and an originator of church raiding in contemporary Ukraine. Mikhail Denisenko, or Patriarch of Kiev and all Ukraine Filaret, as he is commonly titled, is one of those who, being clad in canonical dress, built his political career, who has one foot in the altar of St. Vladimir Cathedral and the other at the political tribune before the crowd of duped Ukrainians. Filaret Denisenko likes attention very much and takes any chance for personal promotion. He is frequently highlighted by the media. He is a cater cousin with many politicians and functionaries, an ally of radical and nationalist organizations. He calls the people of Ukraine to fight for the one national church, the church under his authority. Yet, is the key of patriarchate really a road to God, or rather to an authoritarian leader who is seized by pride and overwhelming desire to rule? If we wanted just to be recognized, we would have stayed with the Moscow Patriarchate. Does it make any difference for us to be subordinated to Moscow or Constantinople? What we need is an independent church that would not depend on any church centers, but act as a church center itself. This is what is necessary for us, what we are fighting for, and what we will finally achieve. Anybody who comes to the Filaret Church must clearly understand that nobody is going to take care of saving their souls or teach Christian moral principles and love for your neighbors. These values are of no interest to the schismatic patriarch. The issues to be considered there, for example, regarding marriage, fasting, are not crucial for the Church per se, and they do not bring about essential changes. Topical issues, which have to be considered at the Council, will not be considered there the number one issue being that of autocephality. Twenty-five years ago, he used to be an acting patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, a vociferous opponent of the Ukrainian language, a committed servant of the Soviet system. Currently, he is one of the most vigorous nationalists, calling himself a true primate and patriot. Filaret runs the church, which he personally believes a sacred weapon in the fight against his former Orthodox brethren, the fellow creatures who, in the remote 1990s, did not recognize him as the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. To date, Filaret says he relied only on God's will when he participated in the elections of Patriarch. I spoke about it at the Council that I could have become the Patriarch, but I surrendered all to Jesus and prayed to be blessed by God's will, rather than to be guided by my own wish. If I'd pursued a target of becoming Patriarch of Moscow, I'd have become, but I hadn't. Journalists often ask Mr. Denisenko about the landmark event, but do not bother to reveal actual facts. Intentionally or not, they omit voting details, avoid sharp edges, and say he lacked just a few votes to come to the patriarchal sea. We could have been 
You could have become the primate of the whole Moscow church, but you were several votes short at the council. Well, you admitted if you'd want it, you'd have become the patriarch. On 7th June 1990, at the local council held in St. Sergius Holy Trinity Lavra, Metropolitan of Leningrad and Novgorod Alexei became a new patriarch with an advantage of 139 votes. Vladimir Sabadan, at that time Metropolitan of Rostov and Novocherkassy, ranked second having 107 votes. As for Mikhail Denisenko, who was more than sure about his victory to be when he was leaving Kiev for the council, he finally received as little as 66 votes. It was like a slap before the entire world, as he used to be an acting patriarch and in the end got rejected at the polls. According to eyewitnesses, when they were announcing the name of the new patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Filaret, who was living through the last minutes as an acting patriarch of the Holy See, looked particularly suspended and seemingly embarrassed. He had virtually handed over the reins to his replacement in Kiev and was getting ready to put on the green patriarchal mantle. On Filaret was a kind of person to hold everybody in the grip of fear and obedience. He was not faithful. He was a party's messenger then, in order to keep the church life under control. He did not have a habit to reckon with anyone. He knew he had power behind him. Filare did not have the slightest doubts he'd win. The fact is, at that time, one could have become acting patriarch with authorization of the political bureau of the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party. It meant the choice was made in his favor, so it was just a matter of formal voting. That was the way Denisenko used to think. He was explained later that times had changed. Out there was perestroika, with the political bureau being unable to influence the episcopate under modern conditions of glasnost. On the eve of the Patriarch's elections, Filaret went to meet with Anatoly Lukyanov, who was a member of the Central Committee. Filaret reminded him the case had been agreed with the Central Committee and Denisenko would be elected Patriarch. Mr. Lukyanov replied, Mikhail Antonovich, he was called so then, we are no longer able to help you about it. We can't even help ourselves. Михаил Антонович, бо його так звали туди. Тепер ми вам не можемо помогти. Тепер і ми собі не можемо помогти. After Alexei II had been elected Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Filaret, being down in the dumps, pronounced the words that became eventually his life goal. Уже тогда, когда when he was watching the congratulation ceremony, Filaret turned to me and said, Now you can see the last patriarch of the one Russian church. My blood ran cold then. Having returned to Kiev, Filaret began a thorough work in promoting himself as a single lifelong primate of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. In October 1990, at the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Ukrainian Exarchate became the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, with autonomous and independent governance, while Filaret was made Metropolitan of Kiev and all Ukraine. Filaret. By adopting the UOC statute, Filaret laid foundation for his further schismatic activity. I understood it. Raising his hand, Filaret seemed to be waiting for this. For a while, he fastened his eyes upon me. I said, we are discussing a clause related to the lifelong term of the Kiev Metropolitan. However, this is a prerogative of the Patriarch of the Domestic Church. Besides, there is no provision on regular Synod members. It provides a loophole for any speculations and manipulations. Being the head of the church, Mr. Denisenko demonstrated an authoritarian management style. 
Metropolitan Philaret's strong hand covered everything. He dictated all archbishops what the statute had to be like. In fact, he could not stand any other opinion contrary to his. Thus, there wasn't any collective decision of the Church by adopting the statute. Philaret could not especially conceive his dislike for nationalists. Until he was proclaimed Patriarch of Kiev, he never spoke in Ukrainian, believing it was a mixture of the Jewish and Polish languages, as he called it himself. Rus christening is spiritual birth of the Orthodox Russian people. Rus christening is a birthday of the Russian Orthodox Church. Rus christening is the beginning of the history of Holy Kievan Rus. Nobody had ever heard a single word in Ukrainian from him. When Ruh nationalists raised their heads, I came to him once and said, Your Eminence, since we are the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, let's sing at least one liturgy service once a month in Ukrainian, using the most appropriate translations of holy hymns of Ukrainian composers, Koshitz, Leontovich, Stetsenko. He was gazing me, and his facial expression was changing. His regular complexion turned into smoke blue. He said, this is out of the question. It was already at that time that Filaret broke his oath. One of the most vivid examples of his mocking at all Orthodox canons was breaching of monastic vows. In 1950, Mikhail Denisenko was tonsured a monk, taking the monastic name Filaret. Back at that time, he told a lie in the face of God. Four years earlier, when he was a seminarian student at Odessa Seminary, he met a certain woman, Evgenia Petrovna Radionova, who subsequently cohabited with him during all his further life. Evgenia introduced herself in public as Filaret's sister. However, in the church ambience she was known as Filaret's spouse, a civil wife, while her three children, Vera, Luba and Andrei, who were registered as fostered, purportedly taken by Evgenia Petrovna for upbringing from different orphanages, were blood children of his eminence Filaret and his cohabiting partner. The whole family lived together in Filaret's residence at 36 Pushkinskaya Street. What was allowed to be said could be said in private between the two priests, no more, to be able to know a potential whistleblower. Every priest was on their palms. Comments were delivered later by those who were affiliated to St. Vladimir Cathedral, Pushkinskaya residence and Orthodox news magazine. They could tell a lot of things, but when Filaret and his civil wife were ruling, everybody was afraid of them. Evgenia Petrovna was not called other than Mistress of Kiev, exceptionally by her first and patronymic names. Like the First Lady, she accompanied Filaret at all formal receptions and made decisions on appointments in the Supreme Church hierarchy. According to eyewitnesses, Filaret could not take any important decisions without her consent. For instance, Transfers of bishops from one chair to another were impossible without her blessing. Whatever resolution she might have concerning a given priest or a bishop, Filaret conscientiously followed her. This woman deadlocked the then Metropolitan Denisenka in her iron grip, intimidating him that unless he obeyed her, she would tell at the Holy Synod they had children. These details from the Metropolitan's personal life were known when one of his daughters wrote an open letter. I am Vera, Filaret's blood daughter. 
In this letter, she admitted that Philaret is a father of three children, how thoroughly her father and mother kept their family secrets and made the children lie, addressing their father Philaret in public other than Vladika. Besides, the letter told how the parents put their son Andrei behind the bars. Prior to Philaret's appointment as Metropolitan of Kiev, his son, together with his grandmother, Ksenia Radionova, mother of Evgenia Radionova, went to Patriarch Pimin to tell the truth about Philaret and his cohabitee. The patriarch did not receive them. Upon coming back to Kiev, Andrei and his grandmother could feel parental rage in full. Philaret and Evgenia Petrovna accused their son of stealing valuables. Having gained support of the authorities, who were ready any time to help Philaret for his commendable service, their parents imprisoned their son and dispatched him far away from Kiev. Personally, Philaret is unwilling to give comments about his family, but takes delight in telling how, at the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church in 1992, he was made to leave the post of the UOC primate. In that film, so boring. At this council, they offered me to renounce the Kiev chair. A valiant consort of the Soviet system, Filaret, following the proclamation about Ukraine's independence, took the nationalist side, who had wished shortly before to drown in their own blood. He has always been law-abiding before the authorities. What the latter said, he repeated. He voiced their ideas during the Soviet period. So when Ukraine gained independence and President Kravchuk came to power, Filaret began to dance to his tune. Typical political flexibility of Filaret was written about by journalist Alexander Nezhny in Agonyok magazine back in 1991. One cannot underestimate an exceptional flexibility of his beatitude, the ability inherent only in him to adopt the most beneficial political coloring at a particular historic stage, alongside with the poor but quite effective speculation on the faith of our fathers. A lot of my interlocutors are deeply mistaken when they assume he will stay as much rigorous and irreconcilable adversary to the idea of national rejuvenation and religious tolerance as he used to be. I think very soon when he makes probes and assessments to find out on whose side the power is, the Metropolitan will have camaraderie with autocephalous counterparts and make friends with the most passionate Ukrainian proponents of independence, swearing like blazes Moscow's who have oppressed his native Ukraine for three centuries. The author of these words must have seen it in a crystal ball. Filaret found a reliable associate in the face of the first president of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk. He began to federate around him the bishops who would be obedient to him. He used force and threats. He is unable to do it otherwise, to get bishops to take his side and to put forward demands on establishing, voluntarily or not, a separate autocephalous church. On 1st November 1991, Filaret convened all Ukrainian local council, where he ordered that all Ukrainian hierarchs sign an address to Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Alexei II, to recognize the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Autocephalus. We signed the address and all the documents Filaret told us to, but we asked him what status our church would have if the Moscow Patriarch had turned us down. He replied, in this case our status would remain as it was, that is, there wouldn't be any schism in the church. He said, 
If Moscow agrees, we will become autocephalous, otherwise our position will be the same. Under the pressure of the Kyiv Metropolitan and the power at his back, all the attendees put their signatures on this address. But soon after, three bishops, Bishop of Ternopil and Kremenets Sergi, Bishop of Donetsk and Slavian Skalipi, and at that time Bishop of Chernovtsi and Bukovina Onufri, revoked their signatures and were immediately removed from their chairs for this reason. Right on the next day, I received a call from Filaret, who informed that by the decision of the Synod, I was transferred to Ivana Frankovsk chair. I was prepared for such turn and asked him for blessing. Then I went to the worship service, where I had to say goodbye to the people and tell them I was leaving. I am sent to another chair, where I have to further serve Christ's Church. Today, I want to call each of you to peace, serenity and accord. This decision is a will of God. I am a bishop, but that doesn't matter, because, first and foremost, I am a monk who has to listen to the voice of the Church. Whenever the Church calls me to go, I go. So I ask you to let me go with peace. After the liturgy, I went to the diocese where the people had gathered waiting for me. They told me they wanted to see me off. So I sent the car back and walked with them for a while. At one moment they stopped, barred all the door exits and told me they wouldn't let me leave. Your beatitude and your eminence. Upon learning about your decision on removal from the chair of our fellow countrymen, Vladika Onufri, we feel rather anxious and indignant. Despite your having powers to determine the destiny of the Church, you do not act for the sake of the Church. We are enraged, because we understand that this transfer to a different chair is nothing else but revenge for the dissent, punishment for the unwillingness to support the cause embarked by you and the majority of the Holy Synod, for the violent separation from the Church Mother, which is motivated by your ambitious desire to get the patriarchal cow. However, in April of 1992, at the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church, when the mentioned address was being discussed, only six Ukrainian bishops out of 21 advocated the idea of granting autocephaly to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. A special attention at the Council was paid to the personality of Filaret himself. By that time, there had been filed a great number of complaints against him. The clergymen were complaining about the dictatorship, established by Denisenka in the church and his evident breach of monastic vows. Why didn't they bring up the issue with Filaret earlier? Because it was not possible to address this issue officially. He was not an ordinary man, and he had support from the state authorities, so nobody could dare raise this question. The Council of 1992 did not judge Filaret for his national idea, the idea of autocephality, as he or his adherents try to feature it, but for his managerial style and methods of work in the way he administered the Ukrainian exarchate and later the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It judged him for his personal life and his activity, which reached out the general public and became a temptation among ordinary believers, not only among the clergy. Now, 
Now, Filaret affirms he was made to vacate the post of the primate, that on that day he nearly had to ascend to Golgotha. Actually, after he had heard all the claims in his address, Filaret accused the highly ranked clergy of interfering with his personal life. He declared he had no intention of listening to allegations of his having a family. The Ukrainian hierarchs did not want to defend their deceitful primate. They obviously could no longer hide his sins. He wanted to make some bishops support him at the council. They were supposed to leave the room together with him after his response to the accusations and allegations of the higher clergy that he had a wife, Evgenia Petrovna, and children, which he deemed as a personal insult. This Dimash would show how deeply humiliated he was. Украинской Православной Церкви с Украины, предел Украины, должны встать и покинуть с ним зал. So, Filaret stood up from the presidium and started to move slowly along the wall towards the exit. He was looking around to see how many people were following him. Around five persons slightly stood up. He understood he had lost. Anticipating the end of his church career, Filaret took the floor and announced he was ready to leave the primate's post, and upon coming back to Ukraine, he promised to hold elections among the Ukrainian episcopate for the post of the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Ukrainian archbishops came up to me and said he would deal deceitfully. During the session I said to him, they say you'll deceive us. He answered, I give you my word of Archbishop. I replied, you give it just to me, tell it before the entire council. So he stood up and said, we are Orthodox, we are Christians, and we must act according to the Gospel. If our word is yes, then it means yes. If it is no, then it means no. I promise, when I come back to Kiev, I will resign from office of the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and let the Episcopate elect their new primate. We shouldn't forget about our word. According to the Gospel, but yes will be your word, yes, yes, no is not present and that over it from Crafty. If I said I would do it, then I will do it. I will submit a petition to the Council of Bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church with a request to deprive me of powers of the primate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and elect a new person for this post. На это место нового представителя. However, when he came back to the capital of Ukraine, Filaret let everybody understand that every word he had pronounced at the council was a pure lie. Все поверили в это. Everybody believed him. Nobody could even imagine he was able to deceive like a devil to swear on the cross and at the same time to know that tomorrow he would resort to hypocrisy. Denisenka was not going to leave. Today, taking advantage of the fact that a lot of people have forgotten the details of that meeting of the council, Filaret states he gave no pledges. When Moscow saw that when Moscow saw the Ukrainian Church was able to separate from the Moscow Patriarchate, they convened a council where they proposed me to resign from the Kiev chair. Why? Because they wanted to appoint a metropolitan who'd be suitable for them and who'd not advocate the idea of autocephalous church in Ukraine. That was the reason why they wanted to eliminate me.
whatever Mr. Denis Senka might say at the moment, back in the year of 1992, when he refused to step down, he stigmatized himself in the eyes of the entire Orthodox world. He committed another perjury. The youth stuck together and demonstrated unity, although some old fighters who'd known Filaret for decades were unable to grasp these changes. Some of them even said, Filaret will disperse you, he is such a gigantic machine, he has such connections, possibilities, he will drive you all out. But we had a clear-cut vision, didn't give in and managed to resist it and stay together. I can't even tell you how exactly, as it was not comprehensible enough for us. But in our hearts we sought one and the same thing, and thanks to this we were are able to withstand this challenge. Even nuns from the Holy Protection and St. Florus nunneries came to us to know on whose side Lavra was. When they learned we were not with Filaret, it encouraged them and they said they would not take his side too. In view of the situation in Ukraine, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church entrusted senior hierarch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Metropolitan of Kharkov and Bogoduchovny Kadim, to convene the Council of Bishops. At that time, Filaret was not an actual primate of the Church, but deemed himself to be, trying hard to hamper the event. He was aware of the fact there would be held elections of the new Church primate. Therefore, he intimidated the Ukrainian hierarchs and imposed pressure on them. Namely, for this reason, the council took place in Kharkov, not in Kiev, where the power of Filaret was quite strong, but no longer canonical. I called Filaret and told him I'd been blessed to convene the council in Kiev. He replied, we had no chance, we wouldn't be able to get to Kiev, and that he would hold this council. The Council in Kharkov removed Metropolitan Filaret from his post of the Metropolitan of Kiev and all Ukraine and forbade his service in the church. Currently, Filaret says the Council in Kharkiv was illegitimate because only he was authorized to convene such pan church assemblies. They initiated council in Kharkov. Yet it was solely the primate's authority to convene such council. If we speak in canonical terms, as they keep talking about canonicity now, they violated themselves fundamental canons. Who convened the council? A diocesan archbishop, Kharkov Metropolitan. Possessing a unique political instinct, Filaret Denisenka always knew when and what to say in order to enlist support of the public at large and the nomenclature that stands at the helm. Therefore, when he was creating his cosmetic church, Filaret turned to the politicians rather than the parish and was right, the former didn't fail him. The first to respond to the decision of the council in Kharkov was the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine and President Leonid Kravchuk, who was on good terms with Filaret. A word of the people in authority meant a lot to Filaret. He treasured his friendship with them, for instance with the first secretary-general of the Communist Party in Ukraine, Mr. Shcherbitsky. Filaret has always tried to do his best to make friends with the highest echelon of power in Ukraine. So when Kravchuk came to power, Filaret got close to him very quickly. They used to say Denisenko was even a kum, godfather of Kravchuk's family member. Following Kharkov Council in 1992, civil servants from the Religion Committee of the Cabinet of Ministers announced they had got to know about this event post factum for mass media and they did not recognize its legitimacy, though Kravchuk knew very well when and where the council would be held. He was perfectly aware of the threat it would pose for his kum Denisenko. Furthermore, during the session of the council, representatives of the state power made calls to Kharkov and insisted on archbishops yielding to Filaret and not opposing to him. When we held this council, they told subsequently I had done it so that the authorities could not know about it. How could they be unaware if they called me every two hours? 
I heard, Nikodim Stepanovich, do not stand in opposition to Filaret. The legitimacy of this council was not recognized by Filaret Denisenko himself, who believed he had been absolutely unreasonably anathematized. Having gained the support of the power, he became the head of his own church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kiev Patriarchate, calling it a successor of the Kiev Metropolitan and demanding that the All Orthodox Council grant it an autocephalous status for this church. Apart from his initial perjury, Filaret went on acting unlawfully and initiated schism in the church, having no blessing of the Council of Bishops. Consequently, he was ungowned, untonsured, and thus he is neither an archbishop nor a monk. He is just a secular man and has lost divine bishopric grace. Denisenko had and has no grounds to demand autocephaly. According to the dogmatic law, Filaret, or to put it right, Mikhail Denisenko, is a personality who is deprived of all his titles, forsworn and anathematized. One should have phenomenal impudence to demand autocephality for the church you betrayed, having split it, and Filaret does have such impudence. не разделили единую украинскую православную церковь. They split the one Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Until the council in Kharkov, there used to be a single church in Ukraine, big and powerful. The Moscow Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarch initiated the council in Kharkov that led to this schism. As a result, there appeared in Ukraine the Kiev Patriarchate as a domestic church and the Moscow Patriarchate, which is subordinated to Moscow. Ukraine Patriarchate как поместная церковь и московский патриархат, который подчиняется Москве. Filaret does not believe himself at his center and still fancies he is a lifelong primate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He continues to retain St. Vladimir Cathedral, where he was blessed to serve as a dean back in the Soviet times. In this cathedral, he used to perform services in the church Slavic language as an archbishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and say the Ukrainian language catered for the nationalist movements. Denisenko took the residence in 36 Pushkinska Street that belongs to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He did not give back the church treasury of the EOC to its legal owners and appropriated it to himself after he had learned that Metropolitan Vladimir Sabodan was elected primate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Filaret keeps his schismatic patrimonial estate with an iron grip. Those who followed him have a problematic life. Each functionary of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kiev Patriarchate is caught on a hook by their landlord. The current political situation suits Filaret perfectly. After Maidan, developments in Donbas and the Crimea, when Russia was proclaimed a main enemy of Ukraine, he did not opt for the position of archpaster, but chose to be an archpatriot. Those who are influenced by Moscow live in falsehood. It is known all over the world. That is why we are slurred too. Thus, instead of relieving and consoling the afflicted, he sparks the war, stirs up Ukrainians to kill their fellow citizens, their brothers in faith. From the very beginning of his career as a schismatic patriarch, Filaret did not see anything wrong about using brute force, involving ultra-radical groups into his business. In 1992, before the raiding seizure of Kiev Pechersk Lavra, he had conducted Moleben service for the UNSO fighters and blessed those militants who subsequently bet heavily the Lavra's monks. <laughs> When I was in the belfry tolling, the fighters told me to leave and then hit my head with the pistol handle. Did you see the pistol? Yes, I did. 
What is it? A gun. Why do you carry it? For security. How are you called the Ukrainian people's self-defense? What is this bag for? For the priest's security. What priest? Metropolitan Filaret? I don't know. What is the purpose of your assault? We want to return the church to Ukraine. Doesn't it belong to Ukraine already? This church, Lavra, is occupied by Moscow elements. The Church of Filaret asked us for our assistance. Have you ever come here to pray? No. For over 20 years, Filaret has used the same methods. Today, the Kiev Patriarchate has on its hand militants from the right sector, as well as fighters of the notorious battalions. They blatantly raise against defenseless faithful of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church not only their hands, but also their weapons, for the sake of prosperity of the only politically correct Church of Mikhail Denisenko, those who believe themselves patriots commit crimes against their fellow citizens. In numerous interviews, Filaret Red states nobody uses any force against the faithful of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. We do not use force with regard to the Moscow parishes. This transition to the Kiev Patriarchate takes place peacefully and smoothly. However, we can see it the other way about in reality. Armed with the worst technique of Bolshevist propaganda, having announced that any priest or parishioner of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is a public enemy, representatives of the Kiev Patriarchate inflamed the religious war in Western Ukraine. Residents of one and the same village are divided into Patriots and Moscows. However, only a member of the Kiev Patriarchate can be considered a Patriot, whereas a Moscow is anyone who attends a church of the UOC. We all have to rise to the occasion today and fight against, first and foremost, this domestic occupation. Those who can't carry a gun can take paint and write on the fence of those who go to the churches of the Moscow Patriarchate and its priests, traitors of Ukraine, separatists. Unless we do it, we will lose. A lot of things said by Filaret once more prove the fact he not only believes his church to be truly patriotic, but relying on his own conjectures belittles the significance of other churches of the Ukrainian people. This is a well-known story when St. Michael Cathedral opened its doors for the students, who had been savagely beaten by Berkut law enforcers. In fact, a lot suppose if it were a Greek Catholic Church, or a Roman Catholic Church, or even that of the Moscow Patriarchate, whatever, they would do the same thing, since this is what any church must do. This is not true. There is a Greek Catholic Church in Lviska Square. Oh, but this is too far for the students. Let it be. But they could have also gone there. So, you mean to say it was not by force of circumstances, but it was a predicted pattern? Yes, it was. Filaret realizes himself his positions as a patriarch are shaky and claims as for his church canonicity are ridiculous. Therefore, using any poise by hook or by crook, he attempts to seize a coming to possession of significant historic landmarks, which appear as sanctities for all Orthodox, with the Ukrainian authorities peddling his schismatic activity. A case in point is the official permission for the Kiev Patriarchate to hold divine services in the trap Peace Church of St. Sophia Cathedral. To date, Kiev Sophia is a national sanctuary listed in the UNESCO Cultural Legacy Assets.
yet the USCKP representatives, thanks to the good graces of functionaries of the Ministry of Culture and Minister Kirilenko, not merely proclaimed themselves as new owners of the smaller Sofia, but arbitrarily changed the name of Trapeze Church of the Nativity into the Church of Yaroslav the Wise. Not far away from the Key of Sofia, in Desatinny Lane, the building of Filaret's new residence is about to be completed, for the sake of which a number of architectural landmarks were destroyed. It was a purely commercial project of the office and housing premises for hierarchs, with the rest of the flats intended for sale by the construction company Intergal Bud. The owners of this company are members of the parliament from the party of regions. We have such a curious junction between the key of patriarchate and politicians, though there is no wonder about it. They are fused by money. Dressed in bright patriotic outfits, Filaret associates are busy destroying not just worship structures. They are ready to eradicate anybody whose thinking runs counter to theirs. He who refuses to follow Filaret will be undoubtedly stigmatized and judged as a turncoat, a traitor. The Moscow Patriarchate is a culprit of bloodshedding. If there weren't Kiev Patriarchate, Putin would have been in Ukraine. The Kiev Patriarchate is founded by one of the key adversary of nationalist movements, one of the candidates to the patriarchal see of the Russian Orthodox Church. Herewith, Filaret's followers call themselves patriots, authentic Ukrainians and heritors of the ancient Orthodox tradition. Yet, it is not clear what heritage they mean. I want everybody to know the whole bitter truth about former Vladika Filaret. My father, who has renounced his children, my grandmother, his grandchildren and his monastic title to sacrifice it on the altar of his secular status. I keep thinking about the vice of insatiable avarice that overtook my parents' soul, about that animal fear before their well-being and lowly desires for the sake of which they are ready to inflict physical and moral damage even on their mother children and grandchildren. I'd like to warn all those who defend blindly my father Filaret and my mother. Take a look at me, at my granny, my children and my husband, at all relatives who are driven away from Filaret, at crying and suffering of a great deal of bloodless martyrs, terror victims of my father and mother. And you will understand, you must understand how much horrible these people are. Vera Medved, daughter of former exarch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Filaret Denisenko.